Um, I was really glad when you reached out to me. I don't know. I usually like when somebody reaches out to me, I get like a vibe from them. Right. You know, and I think it was the fact that you said ex evangelical. I was like, oh, this is my people because I'm totally I grew up in a fundamentalist evangelical household and I'm sort of also a wayward soul. Uh (laughs) Yes. Yes. And I have been trying to process like should I talk about this should I not but we don't have to the bag pretty much well I I don't mind it's one of those things I was thinking about but um, I'm happy too because I think that it's been a part of my ADHD journey Mm -hmm. so yeah yeah I yeah I think it is it's I mean everything feels like a part right like it's just you know I feel like since my diagnosis I've just been going through everything you know it's just like Mm -hmm. one stone after another turning over so Ah, awesome. Okay. So let's get started then. Um, you are 30, correct? 29. Oh, you're not quite 30. Okay. So, but you were diagnosed, you were diagnosed this year. Is that correct? I was diagnosed in August. In August. Okay. So this is all still very new for you. And you're also recently married, right? Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. So let's go to, let's talk about kind of what was happening in your life um, that led you to sort of start thinking, okay, maybe this is ADHD and to start really look, look into a diagnosis. You were taking a teaching certification or something, right? Yes. I've been working on my master's of arts in teaching and we, I got to the course that was specifically for special education and exceptionality in students. Mm-hmm. Um, and as we were studying these, I've always been, well, I've always been very interested in mental health, um, and different brain spaces. I've, I've been very interested in those. And so when we got to ADHD, well, actually, let me back up. We got to autism. And at first I was like, oh, I'm like, some of these are, are similar, but I don't have issues with, with social stuff, quite like autism, but some of it was very familiar. And then when we got specifically to dyscalculia, um, I don't know if you know what dyscalculia is, but it's a lot like dyslexia, but with numbers. Yeah. I, I had a meltdown. I cried because I realized I have this, like, holy, I have this, this is me. And um, I did a lot of screenings. I talked to my professor and she was like, yeah, it seems like you are, like you likely have it. And she, and then she also said, you know, maybe you should look into ADHD. And I was like, oh, I mean, like, you know, we hadn't quite gotten there yet in our studies, but when we did, it was like, in my face, you have ADHD. And my now husband, boyfriend at the time, um, had been sending me TikToks before this of like, hey, this is you, this is you. And I'm like, oh my God, I don't have ADHD, chill out. They don't even know what they're talking about, right? And so once I finally, you know, do this and I do my research on it, I'm like, yes, this this is absolutely me. Um, and I kind of, self-diagnosed at that point and I was um beginning to just accept that and then at the same time um which comes with ADHD I began to hyper fixate on deconstructing everything else in my life um which then came to like deconstructing my political views deconstructing my faith deconstructing everything um but it read it led me down this like this glorious beautiful road of finding an ADHD diagnosis and acceptance for myself that I never thought I would ever find, um, which completely has changed my life. So while I do, I can also think back to when I was in like third or fourth grade. I think it was fourth grade. My beautiful teacher, she noticed that I had some tendencies to not quite pay attention. And I wasn't really getting the multiplication tables. Like I would almost get it, but the numbers would be mixed up. And she'd be like, you're like, you're so close. Like you have it. And then if I had a piece of paper, I could do the long work in order to figure out, you know, what eight times eight is. I would write out eight, 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 and like track it like Mm -hmm. this. Right. So I, I, I knew how I knew I understood how it worked, but the numbers wouldn't stick. And so she had a meeting with my parents and she said, I think that she might have a learning disability. I think she also might have ADHD. And my parents, bless their souls, were like, no, like, ADHD is for boys. And she's not really hyper at home. And you just don't see these things at home. But really what it was is I was so exhausted from putting forth so much effort throughout the day that I would get home and I would just be completely 
beat, right? So there is a completely different Erica that my teachers are seeing, my friends are seeing versus my parents because I was exhausted. So now after, after having the formal diagnosis, I felt a lot of anger actually um, at first because I, was, I had this feeling of someone presented this to you on a silver platter and you completely ignored it. And then I was upset too, because as a teacher, I am con I'm probably hyper vigilant about looking for neuro, uh, neurodivergencies in my students and seeing how I can reach them effectively. And I became probably, probably a little self-righteous thinking about my teachers and thinking like, how did you miss this? How did you miss that I was having these sensory issues, these attention issues, um, and you didn't do anything. You didn't advocate for me. And I'm getting a little emotional, sorry, because it's just, as a teacher, I advocate for my students every single second of the day. And I didn't understand how I got through 12, 12 years of school plus college without someone noticing mm -hmm. and reaching out and saying, hey, like, you, nothing's wrong with you. You're not broken. Yeah. Your brain just works differently. Um, the first day I tried Adderall, I felt this clarity it was like this breath of fresh air and this was um uh, I guess like the end of August early September it was like this breath of fresh air in my mind and suddenly I could think clearly and it wasn't and how I described it to my doctor was when I'm just trying to function it feels like my brain is this internet browser that has all these tabs open but I can't control what tabs open and what tabs close and where it switches to. And I can't control how many there are. And at any given moment, it, it pops up. But when I'm emotional and I'm in like emotional duress, it feels like I'm in this snow globe and that I'm trying to understand what's going on, but all the emotions and all the different topics and all the different traumas and everything are just like swirling around me and I can't grasp anything. And so I explained that to her. I said, this is what it feels like when I'm okay emotionally. And then when I'm experiencing that emotional dysregulation. And she was like, I, that is the perfect explanation or like description of how it is. And so going back to the Adderall, when I first tried Adderall, I remember I was in the shower and I could remember that I had shampooed my hair and I started crying because I was like, I did, I did shampoo my hair and I remember doing it. Mm. Yeah, and then it was just this flashback to when I was a kid back to fourth grade and thinking of all the times I got physically disciplined because of behavioral issues at school, talking, right? Or uh, like uh, talking or not doing well in my math or different things. And I cried for that little girl that I was because I realized I was being punished for things that were pathological, that were part of my brain system and the maps in my brain. Um, and I wept. So I have had to really do a lot of soul searching to forgive my parents, to forgive the adults in my life, um, and to and to find this the sweetness in the bitterness of knowing that my brain has been different all along, and feeling mm -hmm. feeling different, knowing I'm different. So I hope that answered your question. I talked a lot. I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think I think I answered it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I I. I certainly remember going back and looking at my report cards after my diagnosis and it was so emotional because I also don't remember a lot of my early years, you know, and I think that that's also something that I've talked with some women, you know, I think that's not uncommon with ADHD, <laughs> that there's a lot of our childhood that we don't remember. And I think it kind of goes back to what you were saying with just the, the processing and the overstimulation of memories. Right. And so it's really hard to kind of hone in on certain memories, but I went back and read my report cards and it was, I cried. It was so emotional because I saw early, you know, early, like in the first grade, second grade, my teachers were very complimentary and really like talking about how I was a leader and I was a joy and I was enthusiastic. And, and, and then by like third grade was when it, the comments started shifting and it was really all about like poor handwriting and she's a distraction and she mm -hmm. is talking too much. And it was just like, I just saw these comments like hammering on me 
over and over again. And I was watching through these report cards, my self-esteem and my confidence was just shattered. Right. And it was just constantly like, she's not doing this. She's not doing this. She's not doing this. And I could see the frustration coming through from the teachers too, where it was like, again, you know, I had, I had so much of that grief looking back thinking, how did nobody see the signs? Because they just didn't have a language for it back then. I mean, I'm, I'm 46. So this was like back in the early eighties, which feels draconian now compared to like, you know, some of the (laughs) school system. And yet sadly, a lot of stuff is still happening, but like, you know, there were so many things that nobody even knew what to even look for. So I did have to go through that period, like you said, of like really forgiving my parents for not understanding um, and the teachers for just not seeing, you know, what neurodivergence looks like, you know, and, and, and how those comments can negatively affect certain children. And like, and then I just watched myself, like I said, through these comments, like over time, I just gave up, you know, where I just stopped caring and I stopped going to school. And by high school, I just like attendance was my biggest issue because I stopped going to classes because I was so confused, you know, and I had such issues with math. Um, you know, or you reminded me of the, the, um, the issues with math, my son is going through this too, where it's like, if you ask him, you know, uh, to add or multiply straight numbers, it's totally fine. But if you put it in paragraph form where you give like, you know, those examples where it was like, Susie went to the store and Susie had five times more, you know, money than Jimmy and Jimmy had 12 pennies. And you're sort of like, like when it was written out in sentence form, I would just stare at it. And I was like, I have no idea what you're asking me. I don't know what's happening where, what I, you know, and, and my son who's now in the fifth grade is going through that as well, where I'm like, Oh, I know it's just, just, it's all in the presentation. Anyway, yes. Um, um, yes. What grade do you teach? So right now I teach 10th grade English language arts. 10th grade. Okay. Um, yeah. And I teach at a charter school that serves um, underserved uh, students in the Nashville area. Most of my students are um, from immigrant families or from refugee families. So the, I think it's, I think our statistics is that 97% of our student population at the high school, um, their first language at home is not English. Mm-hmm. So on our English department, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of weight there. And then specifically, because these learners are not first English learners, like they, that's not their first language, it's their L2, there is, there's just a lot of despair, like uh, discrepancy about identifying that if they have like autism or ADHD or BPD because there is that language and that cultural difference so Mm -hmm. that is something that we're noticing in high school that we're always screening always screening for autism or ADHD and other other disorders like that Um, just because when they're younger they can't their parents can't advocate for them because of language and culture Um, so now that they're finally able to advocate for themselves we're able to identify but at that time like early intervention, you know, is key to, to, to having optimal outcomes for ADHD specifically and autism. But because these students aren't getting that, we have to do like extra work with that. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, that's something that I'm noticing. And that's also why in my master's, I've also gotten, I'm almost finished with it, a certificate in um, specializing in autism education so that I can help with the screening and identification process in older students um, mm-hmm. because because autism and ADHD are so close in a lot of ways, it's, it's been beneficial. Yeah, and I think just our understanding of autism has expanded so much over the last few years in terms of, you know, that's not this, I think so many of us still carry that stereotype that autism is like an extreme behavioral, you know, it has extreme behavioral ramifications and that there aren't, you know, that there are so many people who are in classrooms and are still able to, you know, I don't, I hate to use the word function, but you know what I mean? Like there, that right. idea that like, there's so autism is a much broader spectrum than I think mm-hmm. a lot of us understood. Certainly I didn't know. I mean, it wasn't until my ADHD diagnosis that I even really started to 
think about autism mm -hmm. and, and so many of those overlaps and a lot of the stuff, like you said, that where I'm like, Hmm, this is really hitting close to home. Like a lot of the sensory <laughs> stuff, right. Where I didn't, yeah. I didn't even know I had sensory issues until I was diagnosed with ADHD where I was like, huh, interesting. Yeah. Now that you mention it, I do fly yeah. into a rage whenever music is playing and the TV is on it. Like, you know, all of those things where I'm like, wow, I didn't even stop to, to figure out why things were happening to me, because I think so much of the time we're just treading water as fast as we can to like function, you know? And, and so it wasn't, I never even took the time to kind of parse what was happening to me. And I, and I, right. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, the biggest memory that comes up so frequently is I remember I was maybe 10th or 11th grade and I was taking a test and because of the ADHD, of course, I get distracted easily. Um, and there's also these sensory issues as well. And when, the, when people are talking and I'm trying to focus, I can't. And I just remember, um, one of my good friends was sitting in front of me and she was talking so loud. And meanwhile, I'm the last person taking this test and I already feel stupid, right? Because I've just, I was a very average average student overall, but I had actually studied really hard for this one and I was still last. Um, and she was just talking and talking and talking and finally I just went, shut up. And we got into like this verbal altercation. She's one of my best friends. Um, but like looking back at that, I know that, that this happened because I was completely overstimulated. And I went to a very small private Baptist school that didn't do IEPs, didn't do modifications, didn't do anything like that. So I was where I was, you know, and I didn't have anyone advocating or, or identifying, hey, like this is a sensory issue. And in fact, like the more research I do, I feel like ADHD at its core is a sensory disorder. Um, or, or it has components of a sensory disorder, um, typically, because if the hyperactivity, the impulsivity, we're trying to either fulfill and get more um, stimuli, or we're trying to push away stimuli. So I, I feel like that needs to be more addressed, especially in, um, in diagnosing ADHD, and we make further advancements in it. So, yeah, that memory still, like, embarrasses me at the same time, but I, but it's true, like that's why I have noise canceling headphones when I'm at work. I always have to be facing a wall. Like, um, you know, I have to kind of deprive myself of outside stimulus so I can get my get my work done. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said earlier, you know, so much of this diagnosis is, is having the, that grace with yourself, right. Where now you understand why things are happening a little more. So I can, I find that I don't get into a rage as much as I used to, because I can start to see the, the red flags earlier. And so I can make sure I don't get to that point of taking on too much or getting to that point of overstimulation. So like I've noticed, you know, just as a parent and as a, as a partner, like, I'm much more kind of even keeled because I don't allow it to get as bad. <laughs> I don't allow That's, it to get yes. to the point where I, where I'm like, everybody shut up, you know, where I can, <laughs> which is what used to happen. You know, that, that's yeah. how it used to happen. And then everybody would stop and be like, Whoa, what happened to you? Like it would seemingly come out of nowhere. Well, and then also my little brother, my little stepbrother has Tourette's growing up. Okay. Um, and so this was a constant thing in our house where he would be doing his threats, his picks, and it would just drive me absolutely insane. Um, and then I would get in trouble for, for exploding, right? Because I'm supposed to be the patient older sister and all of these things. And meanwhile, like, you know, he's over here getting to do his neurodivergent patterns, right? And that's how I felt when I was younger. Like, like what the is wrong with me, right? Like, why, like, why am I so mean to my little brother? Um, and it, it honestly did cause a lot of hardship in our family um, between us to the point where I ended up just staying in my room constantly because I didn't want to be overstimulated by, by his tics and his Tourette's. So that was an interesting component growing up as well. But even in college, we shared, we, you know, there's a wall between our two rooms and I would be studying or writing a paper. And if I could hear him doing his noises, I just would have an emotional breakdown. So I had on three fans in my room constantly, constantly. And I would listen to rain and white noise just so I wouldn't explode on him. But as I've gotten older and I realize it's ADHD, I can explain it to people. Like I explain it to my husband. Hey, I know that you're playing your video game. You're doing all that. I'm going to just go upstairs for a little bit. And my last, because I just, it's too much right now. It's too much. Mm -hmm. And he's 
usually pretty understanding about it. So. Yeah, I was just talking about this with somebody. I don't think the interview has aired yet about like with my kids, even though once they were old enough to no longer take naps, I still took naps not <laughs> because yeah. I okay. needed, there was like, you know, I needed like an hour in the afternoons mm -hmm. just of nothing, you know, where I was like, I don't necessarily need to fall asleep. I just need like time to stop. Um, and I didn't realize at the time that that was like a, a silence and a recharge. And it was the same. I needed brown, like really loud brown noise. And I just needed to be like in a sensory deprivation of my room. Yeah. And, yeah. um, and of course at the time, because I didn't realize what was, you know, that this was ADHD, this was pre-diagnosis. So I just thought I'm a terrible mom. I'm lazy. Mm -hmm. I need a nap. Oh my God, what's wrong with me? Like, that's what, yeah, like you said, like so much of this diagnosis is this revelatory way in which we can be kinder and gentler to ourselves. Right. And like, and that's why I, I was looking at one of the posts, I think it was the post where you had, you had on Instagram, where you had shared your, the actual diagnosis, like the little sheet yeah. where you had said, you know, where you had said, Ooh. like I was diagnosed and I was reading your caption. It was great. And you know, I don't want to call anyone out, but one of the responses was like, hang in there. And it just like, oh, it was like nails on a chalkboard because I always talk about how frustrating it is to, to talk about this diagnosis in such a way where you're like, no, you don't understand. This is really like the best thing that's ever happened to me. And people being like, I'm so sorry about your disorder. <laughs> like, no, I'm so glad I have a name to it. Right. right? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Because, and because like, I, and I've written about this in, in my blog, Unseen ADHD, that was the first post I just put out there. Like I word vomited and I did not hold anything back. Um, I did try, I mean, I tried to be very gracious with, with my parents and, and how I wrote about, wrote about them, but at the same time, um, and I don't, I don't have a relationship with my stepmother anymore that has for, you know, just for protecting my own mental health that has been dissolved, but specifically our relationship when I was growing up was it was very tumultuous and a lot of it now that I'm looking back was because of my ADHD symptoms it would be I um, you know like I forgot to do a specific chore or I did a specific chore the wrong way or just these things that come from ADHD and getting those negative messages of you know that I was lazy or that I was selfish and that that isn't the case and so I became hyper vigilant, you know, to make sure that I wasn't a selfish person, that I wasn't lazy. Um, and my husband will tell anybody, like, I'm the hardest working person that he knows. Um, and even at the time, uh, um, so I lived with my parents when I was an undergrad. I had a full scholarship tuition or full tuition scholarship um, for theater. And so I not only was in school full time constantly, but my work work was helping out in the theater. And doing these things so I was gone I would say like 70 70 to 80 percent of the week and when I was home I was cleaning or I was studying or writing papers um and it just never quite seemed to be enough and so that selfishness again you know was was brought up the selfishness laziness um because I was you know focusing too much on my schoolwork or or I was spending time with my friends when that wasn't the case you know I was I was trying to keep my scholarship and, and do all of these things while at the same time struggling with ADHD in general. And so looking back, that brings a lot of heartache because I feel like at the time, like I'm looking at my students now and their parents understand ADHD. Their parents have TikTok, their parents have Facebook, like parents are becoming more aware. But when I was growing up, it, that's not what it was. It was a discipline issue or it was a behavioral issue or an attitude issue. And I just like look back at this girl that just loved her parents and loved her stepmom so, 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 so much, but felt like she could never do, do it correctly. And those negative messages just constantly really hurt my self-esteem and created this hypervigilant person um, to, to ensure that people didn't think I was lazy, that people didn't think I was selfish. Um, but, it, but also in a lot of ways, I think it also positively as well, because because now I, I guess like I have my, my uh, antennas out 
for that kind of behavior. If that makes sense. I don't know if that does, but yeah. yeah. Well, I, you know, I was always, I was the youngest and I was always sort of the quote unquote trouble kid growing up. Right. So I was like the kid that my parents didn't know what to do with. And so I had well-behaved older brothers, but I cannot tell you how many women I have interviewed since I started this podcast, who were the good kid, you know, who had Mm -hmm. a sibling, like you said, with your younger stepbrother, like who had a sibling who was more high maintenance, who had a diagnosis of something. And so they had all of this pressure from their parents to be the good kid, you know, and Mm -hmm. how that, that, that labeling, that assumption that you had to like keep together and that you couldn't need anything and you couldn't want for anything because, you know, you had this other child that was sort of the causing all this grief. And so you ended up like keeping everything in and it was, would lead to all of this anxiety and depression as an adult. And I'm like, oh my God, like, this is, this is such that, that female experience of like, yeah. Oh, you know, we need you to, you know, hold down the fort and, you know, and then you sort of internalize all of that idea of like, I can't advocate, you know, and, and my worth is based on how quiet I am or how behaved I am. Right. And I'm like, no wonder everybody's such a ball of depression and anxiety. Right. Um, but also, yeah. like you said, there is that sense of like, we all, we, something that does come out of that is that sense of self-reliance and that grit that we like to talk about. I like to talk about, right. I feel like a lot of us have that, like, okay, yeah, that sucked. What can I do now? Right. How can I move on? How can I pick myself up? And I do feel like we are really good at that because there was always that sense of like, I know I'm bright. I know I'm smart. Um, and you know, I just at least need to prove to myself if I can't prove to other people. Um, and so I, it, it's, I think that is something that's been very common in the interviews. I've had so many women who have had that experience from childhood, right. Where they were like, they were the good kid and, and how that, you know, and, and so I'm being very careful in terms of like my parenting with my two kids. Like I'm so vigilant about what kind of labels I give them. Right. Because I think it's very easy as a parent or even as an educator to like see somebody and be like, okay, you're this kid, you are this person and you are this person. And I expect this from you. And I expect this from you. And I'm realizing like, as an adult, how, especially as a neurodivergent adult, like that can be really, really damaging to be labeled and kind of pigeonholed with these descriptions and these expectations. Um, And I don't really know what the better way is, you know, like, I also sort of feel like, like, I've talked about this with my mom. Um, You know, she sort of, I got terrible grades. And so she was always trying to make me feel better. So she was like, well, university is not for everybody. It's okay if you don't graduate or whatever, like, it's fine. And I also realized that that was kind of damaging to my self-esteem in its own way, because even though she was trying to make me feel good, she was also sort of confirming that I couldn't go to university (laughs) and that I felt like I needed more pressure. So now as a parent, I'm like, well, what do I do? Do I, do I lay the pressure on? Because I know that that's really important for, for a child to prove to themselves that they can do the thing. Or do I say everything's whatever you do is fine with me. I love you no matter what, you know, like, I don't know. I feel like there's ways in which both are important and yet both can also be potentially. Well, and it's, it's hard because there's this like Trinity, right. And this is our motto at our school is like to empower, to honor and challenge. And so like, it's that, you know, that golden ratio of, of how to invest in these kids. Um, but then there's, there's such like a, a wide array of doing that. How do you empower them and then also challenge them or honor them and challenge them? You mm-hmm. know, it's, it's that, you know, that dichotomy or trichotomy. Um, but, you know, and I agree every time I listen to your podcast too, I've noticed this pattern of, you know, like, well, if, you know, if I behave this way, or if I just keep my needs to myself, like, oh, you know, my parents, for me, the message was, my parents will love me more or my stepmom will love me more if I don't say, Hey, I need new underwear or X, Y, and Z. Right. So I think for me, what happened, and I think ADHD had a huge hand in this looking back is I became hyper fixated on my faith and on what my church growing up said that I should act like and be like, and be like. And so at 14, I, you know, I really did have a beautiful spiritual experience. But along with that came this, this change in personality to where I constantly was 
defining with these ADHD tendencies at the time I didn't know that it was ADHD I thought I was just I was a bad kid I thought I was lazy I thought I was stupid I thought I was all of these things and so after the spiritual experience that I had I I, like really hyper fixated on on how I was supposed to behave according to my church on how I was supposed to behave and I met all of these expectations perfectly to the point where my dad even um, converted to the same religion that I was at the time but it still wasn't enough like for my stepmom right and it still wasn't enough down the road I was the good kid I was the kid that um, if my friends wanted to go and do something that they know their parents going to let them do, they'll be like, oh, well, Erica's going. And I'm like, oh, well, Erica's going. Yeah. <laughs> go do it. Oh, Erica's doing cocaine? Sure. Go for it. Right? It was like that attitude of, oh, you know, Erica's so good kid. Um, and then I was like, you know, as I got older and I did get this diagnosis that, or claimed it for myself, deconstructing all of these things, I realized I really, really clung to what I was told I was supposed to be like and who I was supposed to be because I wanted to feel understood but even then I didn't feel understood I never felt understood um and that has been like my heart's long is I just want to be understood and when I found ADHD in the ADHD community especially on TikTok I was like I have family now I'm good (laughs) traumas are healed they're gone not really but, but along those lines Yeah. And it is something, there is this small part of me that sometimes fears since my diagnosis, because it has, you know, because I have felt so seen and so understood and, and it does feel like so many questions in my life have been answered from ADHD that there is this part of me that kind of wonders, is this something I'm clinging to? Because I, you know, I think that that is, um, that is definitely a theme in my life. And I wouldn't be surprised if this was a theme in, in a lot of our lives as women, which like you said, like that, that need for belonging, right. That chasing of an identity, that chasing of like what something is off with me and I don't know what it is. So maybe I, if I, like, if I join this group, like wanting so desperately to belong. Right. And, and so I've seen it in terms of, you know, I deal with it with, with dieting, right. And, and body image Mm -hmm. and that sense of like reinvention and this promise that if I do this thing, I'm going to be a new person tomorrow. Right. And so you see that with the diet industry, right? Which is like, I promise that, you know, you're going to be, if you lose weight, you're going to be happy. And then when you're not happy, you're sort of like, well, I must need to lose more or, you know, there's something wrong with me. And that sense that like you fall for these, we fall for these promises all the time because of that desperate need to, to be other, you know, to, to belong and to not be ourselves. And so you see that theme, I think in a lot of our, the choices we've made in our lives from, yeah, like there are so many parallels with, in terms of the, the Christian community and church and, and so much of that desire to be part of a community. Right. And, and so like, I, you know, that is something I also talk about with, with, when it comes to like my diagnosis is that, I am always worried that especially my family members are going to think like, oh, now Katie's just jumping on a whole new train and that maybe this is just something, some flash in the pan excuse that she's got. It's, you know, now she's clinging to ADHD and like there, there is this small part of me that is terrified that this is like one new fad because my ADHD causes me to chase fads. (laughs) (laughs) So you're like chicken or egg. Um, I mean, I get yeah. that. And, and that comes with the hyperfixation, you know, that we, that we get into. Um, and the parallel between autism and ADHD here is actually very interesting um, because persons with autism, you know, they have those special interest areas, but, but they don't typically change throughout their life. What's different with ADHD is ours will change. And I actually was just talking to one of my professors about this. Um, my latest <laughs> hyperfixation is candle making. But I don't know why. Candle making, candle dressing, and like pr- like praying and like doing certain like woo woo stuff over the candles. Like it just it gives me life. But before that, it was playing the ukulele, and I learned it in a week. And I was like, ah, I'm done. But that's one thing that I love about ADHD is the ability to learn so many different 
things, uh, you know, being a jack of all trades, even though I'm not really a master at any of them. Um, when people ask me, like, what are some of my talents? Sometimes I kind of forget about, <laughs> about them. I'm like, oh yeah, I do this too. Like, you know, I can play guitar, I can sew, I sing, I um, do some creative designing, I paint, I, you know, just like all of these things that I can do. And I just, I forget about them sometimes mm. because there are just so many but I think that's a, a huge blessing of ADHD even though it can be it can be frustrating to like go out <clears throat> and buy all these things for my latest hobby and then after a couple of months I'm like Ugh, I'm done with it you know mm-hmm. like that's that's the worst part of of that that um symptom I think yeah. yes there are some hidden financial costs uh, <laughs> to chasing yeah. lots of different hobbies. But I think I agree. I mean, I think what makes us so interesting is, is the the way in which all of these crazy hobbies we've chased all of our lives, like all lead mm-hmm. to who we are today. Right. And, and I think it really like broadens your horizons. It gives you perspectives, especially like as a teacher, you know, like you, you, you must be able to see it just in the way you approach things, right? You, where it's mm-hmm. like, you might not be able to articulate how learning the ukulele has helped you with X, X or Y in, in something seemingly unrelated like the classroom, but it would like, you know, there are ways yeah. if that, yeah, like all of these things that I've tried here and tried there and to tried that, you know, I, I, they do make me who I am in such a beautiful kind of patchwork way that I appreciate, right? Yes. And it's that generalization of being able to transfer knowledge that I think a lot of specifically women, I'm not sure about men with ADHD, but specifically women with ADHD, I've noticed the ability to create symbols and understand symbols and generalize that information across different contexts, um, which again comes with the different hyperfixations and hobbies that we, that we come across somehow, some way, like you were saying, learning the ukulele helps to inform the other things in my life, like teaching Mm -hmm. somehow, some way it does, which is such a, like such a blessing and such a, such a superpower in my opinion. And honestly, when I first listened to your podcast and you called it a superpower, I'm not, I'm not meaning disrespectfully, but I did roll my eyes. I was like, Oh, how is this a superpower? What do you mean? But the more and more I listened to your podcast, I was like, actually, no, like this, this is amazing that we can do these things um it's amazing so I'm I just like I can't tell you enough how thankful I am that I found your podcast because it was right around the time I was getting my diagnosis and it just I I felt seen and I felt heard and I felt understood yeah I mean it's a great time I think that's what is so important to, you know, in in hearing the stories of other women and and seeing ourselves in their stories I think is it didn't, I didn't realize it at the time when I started the podcast, I just started the podcast Mm -hmm. because I wanted to know if other women, what they were experiencing. And I was just curious. I was like, was your experience like mine? Cause mine was like crazy. Um, but also (laughs) like realizing that how we are learning about our, our ADHD and what ADHD Mm -hmm. looks like in women through hearing the lived experiences of each other, right. Where we're not learning Mm -hmm. about what ADHD looks like because we're reading, these dry articles, um, you know, or we're reading about the DSM or we're reading, you know, going to our doctor and talking about it with them. Like, this is not how we're learning about what this is. We're learning about it through TikTok videos and, Uh you know, and these like vignettes and these moments and where you're sort of like, you know, I can't really tell you about RSD, but I can tell you about how difficult it's been to have friendships and and the difficulty mm-hmm. with texting and all of these things where you're like, oh yeah, I really, oh. yes, yes, all yes, oh, you know, or, oh, right? I'm so <laughs> bad with texting. I'm so bad with it. But that's oh, what I mean. God. Like, it's like, it's, I feel like so much of this is is understanding the varied ways in which a neurodivergent brain has bled into our interpersonal mm-hmm. relationships or our self-esteem or, you know, like, you, you know, our relationship with our parents and sort of those micro aggressions and micro traumas we experienced in childhood with our teachers and all of that. Like it's so huge and there's so much. And so I, yeah, I think it's really like it's sharing our personal experiences is how we're all coming to grips with what this even is as Mm -hmm. adult women. So yeah, it's been, it's been 
I mean, unbelievable to be able to have these conversations with women from all over the world, because I feel like we're all kind of, like you said, we're creating this incredible community that we've been seeking, you know, that we've been looking for our whole lives. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you know, if you know what the Enneagram is, do you know what that is? I mean, um, I took the test and I have a number, yeah. but beyond having a number, I haven't really done much research into what it means. Right. Well, okay. So that was a hyper fixation of mine for a couple of years. And I actually taught a whole course on it um, for about six months at my last school that I taught at. And I'm a, I'm a type four. And so as a four, the core, like the core wound of a type four is, com- is feeling misunderstood, even though they're completely authentic all the time. So that resonated with me. And then just seeing how that informs what I understand about ADHD has been just monumental for me um so yeah that was another thing and you know what and like that's what I love about ADHD is we can become experts on so many different things in such short amount of time Um, and I do feel like I'm an expert on the Enneagram and I do feel like I am you know not just because of of my master's education but I feel like I am an expert on ADHD and on autism um and I like I just want to keep going and I think part of that that a lot of people with ADHD like we feel like we have to prove ourselves I think like we had mentioned that earlier um and I think for me that's sort of what started my master's program and like why I did it because even though I felt like I already like I I had so much knowledge on the subject that's not enough right like you have to have a piece of paper that says like you know I know what I'm doing um I don't know where I was going with that that was an ADHD no yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Mine, mine, my mind just went blank. So, but yeah, happens yeah, all that. the time. It happens. Um, all, it's the worst is when it happens when I'm teaching, and my students are like, "Miss Tom, hey, <laughs> Miss Tom," like, "I don't know. I don't know what we were when I was just teaching you just then. So let's just write a paragraph." <laughs> They're like, "What?" So it does. It does happen. And thank the Lord, uh, whoever you want to thank for my push in and pull out helpers that help with SEL and um, my exceptional students because Wilma shout out to Wilma Wilma if you're listening to this which I know you will because you're my number one fan girl you rock she (laughs) keeps me on track when my mind gets blank she goes you were talking about and I'm like that's right oh my goodness yes (sighs) right I feel like I I have I have an amazing co-worker system at my school that supports my neuro, my neurodivergence. I have never worked in an environment where I have been given accommodations and modifications. And I have these, these people who just come and be like, you're an amazing teacher. Your brain just works differently. Let me help you. It, this is the best school. Holler, holler out to stint prep. You guys are <laughs> some of you guys. So if they're listening. Then oh, yeah, but. No, that's amazing. Cause you know, we do talk a lot about how difficult it is to kind of stay mm-hmm. in jobs because we so often lack those accommodations and sort of don't know how to ask for help. And oftentimes yeah. we can't articulate what we help we even need. And so we end up leaving in, <laughs> uh, in, you know, being disappointed or, you know, in a rage mm-hmm. or whatever reasons why we've left, um, or, or losing interest. So that is amazing to have right. a support, to see what a supportive environment looks like. And to also know yeah. in the moment to be able to say like, these are the accommodations I need because mm-hmm. of this is who I am. I'm not terrible. You know, there's nothing wrong with yeah. me. This is just what I need. And, and it's funny. Cause whenever I say those things out loud, where I'm like, just ask for help. You know, it's not rocket science. And so whenever I say it out loud, I'm like, why did it never occur to me? Like, I think it all goes back to that same sense of like the narrative that we are told as children, which is like, you are wrong. You just have to work harder. Just, just do the thing. And so we, we internalize that idea of like, I just have to work harder. I just have to figure this out and work harder, even though I really don't know what I'm doing right now, but I, if I work harder, I will figure it out eventually on my own. Right. Like, I think we, we become (sighs) so self-reliant to a fault and then suddenly we're adults and we have no idea how to ask for help for the simplest things. And once we can just sort of step back and say, you know what, there's nothing wrong with me. I need help. There's nothing wrong with needing help. (laughs) And then it's like, it's like your whole world opens up and, 
And yet it's, I laugh at how simple it sounds, you know, like, why did that never occur to me? Um, well, it's almost like sinful. Uh, like to mm, me, it felt sinful to yeah. say, uh, you know, like, oh, I need help or, or because, because it, you know, before the official diagnosis and understanding how it works, it, it was like, why do I need help? I don't need help. I'm just making this up or, oh my gosh, I'm such a, this was a huge message I had in my head that I'm still fighting with is I'm such a weak person. And that's not true. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not true. Um, and I, if it weren't for my coworkers who were, who I now have after this diagnosis, like I would still be struggling with that. My, my, um, and one thing I love about my job too, as someone with ADHD is I have a coach, an instructional coach that I meet with weekly. Her name is Victoria. She is the most beautiful person in the whole world. Um, and I can be honest with her and I can say, Hey, I'm really struggling meeting this deadline. And she's like, okay, cool. Let's, let's come up with another plan. Um, and I just think back to all the other schools that I worked at where that would never have been an option um, because of their lack of understanding ADHD and then also because I didn't have a diagnosis. Um, so it's just, it's wild to work at a place like that. It's mm. wild. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah, that's really, I, I mean, I think there's so much in our culture, in our society, as women, as Americans, that, that sense, you know, that self-reliance is a virtue, right? And so mm-hmm. therefore there is like a moral imperative to be self-reliant, yeah. right? And so there, you know, that's something we could deconstruct for a while. I'm sure that the, the mm-hmm. like <laughs> Protestant work ethic and, mm-hmm. yes. and you know, how 100%. that has, right? And like how, you know, and then how we're taught in schools as well to like be, you know, be as, as, disruption is, is bad. Right. And so therefore Mm -hmm. you need to be as quiet and as small and as obedient as possible. Mm. Oh, Uh. my heart. (laughs) Think of how many women. I know. I want to give us all hugs. Yeah. Neurodivergent or not that have been told to be smaller. Oh yes. I know. I rail, my daughter's 14 and I feel like every, everything, you know, comes back to that. We talk about that so much. We talk about like the pressure because I'm like, it all comes back to obedience. Right. And so we talk, you know, Mm -hmm. when we talk about um, size and sizeism in our society and and how, you know, the feminist angle to all of that and how it's Mm -hmm. like, it's being drilled in you and from all Okay. Yeah. You're going to get me all started on my soapbox. I'm not going to no, go there, I love but it. like, <laughs> I love it. you know, but go, I like, girl, go. right. But I'm just like, everything comes back to the pressure to be obedient in our society. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm like, it all comes back yeah. to the beauty myth and that idea of like, we have to, you know, we are taught to not be free thinkers and we're taught to not take up space. Mm-hmm. And when you are somebody who is meant to be a free bird, right. It yeah. like crushes your spirit. I remember being in high school and, and as a type four Enneagram, if, if anyone listening knows what the Enneagram is or doesn't, it's the, it's like the dreamer, it's the romantic, it's the person that visualizes themselves in movies all the time. Like if I'm in a car and it's raining and I'm by the window, I'm like, oh, I'm the main character right now, right? Like it's that, that feeling. And I just remember wanting to, wanting a boyfriend so bad that I would be like, okay, how many other girls doing it? Okay. They're sitting there. They're like cute. They're quiet. They're oh. <laughs> Like, they're just like, so like, perfect. But me, I'm like a bull in the China shop trying to act like a little lamb. And it's just, it was a disaster. It was a mess. Um, And, you know, like trying to be like this Jane Austen-esque kind of girl. And no, I'm, I'm definitely more of like Fat Amy from Pitch Perfect. And I had to kind of accept that about myself. Like, I'm never going to be that reserved, beautiful, quiet, mysterious girl over in the corner reading a book I'm gonna be the chick that is like tapping her leg buying her pencil and be like hey what are you doing how can I help you what's up what's up do you need someone to talk to you you look sad like that's me and I've kind of I've had to come to understand that and accept that um but yeah but as like a high school and even college student I was like why can't I be like that beautiful small you know, quiet, quiet, little lovely girl so I needs to get like rescued. Mm-hmm. Right. But I don't know. I'm um, yeah. Yeah. I know. Oh my God. I had the very, I mean, I had the same experience and, t- and it's funny because I think that that's very like, 
it's, it's given that idea is given to us for the most part by other women. Right. And so it's a sense of like the competitive nature within us as women, which was why, you know, whenever, when I did meet my now husband who I've been with for 20 years, who like, it's so funny. Cause like, you realize that there are lots of people out there who don't view women that way, you know, who don't judge right. you by your size, who don't say, Oh, I wish, you know, you're so what I love your personality, but you're not dainty enough for me. Like that is an inherently feminine concept, right? Like, I don't think a lot of, maybe there are men who out there who, I mean, I'm sure there are lots of assholes out there who are like, I don't want to date a woman who's more than a hundred pounds and they can go fuck right. themselves. But like, you know, exactly. I, like, you know, I was lucky enough to have had partners who didn't ever, you know, like I realized that I was bringing that so much. And so that's the narrative I try to tell my daughter too, which is like those ideas that are told to you are like, they don't exist. Like, like when you find your people, when you find your person, none of that is going to matter, you know? And, and, um, yeah, we're getting on such a side tangent right now. <laughs> no, I, I love it though. But I mean, like, and I think that does have, have a lot to do with women in ADHD because, you know, we're told to make ourselves quieter, make ourselves physically smaller or, yeah. you know, our personality smaller. And, um, you know, my, my current husband, I have been married before, um, but my current husband is, he's six four. He is uh, like 350 something pounds, like nothing but muscle. Like he's a big dude. And I'm kind of, you know, I'm curvy, right? I got, I got my weight and I'm, I'm cool with it. Like, I like who I am, but whenever I brought that up to him, like, oh man, I wish I was smaller. He was like, why? And I was mm-hmm. like, I just do. And he was like, well, why? And I was like, I don't know. Why? And I was like, I don't know. Okay. Just drop it. I don't know. But it got me thinking like, be- because we were told like that is what's valuable. Um, and even as women with ADHD, we're told that our personalities have to be smaller or we're too much and you know that verse in the bible that talks about um you know that like quieter women are more beautiful I, i'm paraphrasing obviously and that a woman who's loud um draws attention to herself but, you know it's it's this idea of like that if you are a certain way then it goes back to that idea of selfishness and how that's not acceptable and not beautiful but it's not selfishness it's just authenticity and that's the difference. Mm-hmm. So. Beautifully said. Oh, thank you, Katie. Um, okay, Where's so information are my thing. So I know, right? And uh, yeah, and oh, yeah. I, I like I, I do. I want to give all of us a hug from from having to deal with adolescence in general. <laughs> <laughs> but again, why so much, I think there are so many parallels and why I'm always questioning where I'm like, you know, I'll say this on the podcast where I'm like, maybe I don't have ADHD. Maybe I'm just a feminist because so there's so much of this has to do with like the expectations that are placed on women and feeling like we are not meeting those expectations in society because we're square pegs jamming ourselves into these gender more, uh-huh. you know, these gender expectations and, you know, as women and as wives and mothers and all of these things where it's like, I don't want to do that thing I don't want to be that person right right I mean yeah. and let's be honest though if if we weren't in this kind of society our disorder might might still affect us negatively but it wouldn't be as much um because of the social expectation to be mm-hmm. honest you know yeah. if we if you know so that's my my personal opinion on it is like yes it is a disorder and yes it it ca- creates deficits um in certain areas but ultimately it's our society and it's these societal expectations that have been built in forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then it comes back to, like you were saying with the kids that you're teaching, right. Where you see Mm -hmm. how so much of how our ADHD ends up manifesting comes down to accommodations comes down to privilege comes down to you know what was available to us comes down to the discipline in our home life like all of these mm-hmm. things that really like range drastically from different cultures and different you know different races like that's what has also been amazing to me talking to women with so many different backgrounds which was like how yeah, how our, you know, our lives and our environment really shaped who we were as adults with this same neurodivergence that we all had, you know? (laughs) Yes, Um, I agree. (laughs) um, So now if you could rename ADHD to something else, have you thought about what you might call it? (laughs) Just bring it out the paperwork. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I've decided that it would be something along the lines of 
um, emotional, whoop, hold on, thank you. Okay, executive functioning, emotional regulation and sensory processing disorder. Mm, okay, wait, let me, what's the acronym there? You know, that's a good question. Is it, cause it's gotta be a good acronym. <laughs> it's gonna be really long though. So it's E-F-E-R-S-P-D. E-F-E-R-S-P-D. <laughs> Everspeed. Yeah. Oh, we'll figure something out Ever, there. Everspeed. I like that. If you say it with a little Ever bit of speed. How about ever speed? Ever right? speed. Uh, yeah. But, there it is. I love um, that. I like that too. And I, yeah. I always love when the emotional part is brought in because again, I feel like it's the, that's what usually brings a lot of us to understand the ADHD element is not like the hyperactivity. Mm-hmm. It's not the like, who were you when you were a kid? It was the like, oh, the emotional issues that yeah. have come well, out of different. all this stuff we've been talking about. Right. And so the fact mm-hmm. that like doctors, medical professionals, DSM, nothing talks about the emotional, um, Mm -hmm. the emotional kind of ramifications of a life undiagnosed. And they're like, no, you just, you just have depression and anxiety. Here's some medication, Uh go on your way. Um, yes. And the comorbidities that come along with ADHD, like, like ADHD can cause these things or they can be comorbid with it. So for example, my diagnosis for a long time was anxiety, depression, and OCD. Those have not gone away, but I understand now that most of, most of that stems from my ADHD, mm-hmm. um, which is interesting. Yeah, 100%. And with you on that. You're right. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, my goodness. Whew. I'm so stimulated. Uh, like every time I have these conversations, I didn't even get to ask you about witchcraft because you were, you had oh, kind of yeah. talked about it with candles and stuff. But like, yeah. I'm curious kind of where, how that has come into your life and kind of what your thoughts yeah. are on ADHD and witchy, the witchy life. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, so I love my spiritual practices. They are beautiful. I don't know if anyone listening and I get, get scared by the term witch, but really it just means a woman who can self advocate for herself on the spiritual realm is how I look at it. Um, so yeah, I do tarot readings. Um, I also kind of a little bit of a medium by accident. Um, I don't know if it's really an ADHD thing or if it's, I am a medium, but I have had a lot of experiences. Um, I like that. My first one was when I was about nine and, um, we, I was hanging out with this girl I had never met. She lived in my apartment complex with my mom and we were going over to see her neighbor's pet snake. And in my head, I just heard, oh, he died the other day. And so I said that out loud. I said, oh, the snake died the other day. And she goes, how do you know? Like, you don't even live here. And I was like, okay. So we go to her neighbor's house. We open the door to see the pet snake. And she goes, no, he died the other day. Literally verbatim says this. And the girl looks at me. She's like, I have to go home. And I'm like, wait, I don't have any friends. Come back. So it's, it's been, you know, it's, it's been a theme throughout my whole life of like having these spiritual experiences and, and all that. So um, I feel like the witchcraft helps me out with my ADHD because I do candle making and I do, I dress the candles and I bless them and I give them as gifts. Um, and if you want to think of spells as poetry, go for it. That's kind of how I associate it together. Um, oh, those are my cats. I do have 11 cats. So, so they are they're fighting right now because you heard that. I'm sorry. But um, yeah, so tarot reading, oracle reading. Um, and just overall, I do all of that just to help other people process their trauma and their emotions. So yeah, that's my witchy, witchy side. There's a lot more to it, but. I don't think we have the time to quite get into it. I know, it, but... I know. I'll have yeah, to have I you know. come back and tell, talk to me. Because I haven't read, I know oh. there is a lot of overlap, especially in terms of like being empaths and mm-hmm. highly sensitive. And yes. so it all kind of makes sense to me. It's the same, like we were talking about this, like patchwork of who we are, right? I think, I feel yes. like it all kind of, it's on brand. <laughs> 100%, uh, yes. It right? all fits together. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, so uh, totally. Yeah. It makes sense. Um, yeah. Okay. Anyway, so you, um, so you started the blog unseen ADHD when so just, mm-hmm. uh, point people to that, if they want to find out more about yeah. uh, your blog and kind of what you're writing about these days. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, my first, I only have two posts on there because ADHD, um, <laughs> Um, but I am enjoying it. So I'm using a lot of my paper um, in my autism studies and I'm kind of 
um, melding them with my own research and different um, articles, peer reviewed articles I'm finding um, that has to do with empirical evidence with ADHD and how they coincide. So I um, actually just posted a new article today on my blog um, all about sensory issues, explaining why they're there, what they are, the different patterns that we endure. So I, my goal is with, um, with unseen ADHD is to approach it with, with compassion, but also with research um, and an element of, of sophistication, but also accessibility. So that's my goal so that it's just an easy way for people who have ADHD to learn more about it or people who have loved ones with ADHD to come in and understand the different aspects of it. I am hoping it grows. But um, yeah, you can find that at um, www.unseenadhd.com. I did splurge and I did uh, buy the dot com. On that. I think that's awesome. I'm also okay. on, uh, yeah, I'm also on Instagram as Unseen ADHD. And then if you wanted to see some of my witchy stuff, um, that is, I had to write it down because I can never remember the name of stuff. It is um, Christian Witchery Babe. Is another, is that an Instagram account? Yeah, it's an, an oh, Instagram. Oh, okay. And so then, I'll put, um, I'll put uh, yeah. you need to get like a link tree or something. You got a lot I know going I on. do. Yes. And then my final one is also, I am a photographer. I photograph weddings, um, seniors, births, all that kind of stuff, just like in good ADC fashion. That is called Lavender and Lynn Portraiture. I'm based in Nashville. And that is um, a little LLC I have that I've had for about eight years now. So of course. Yeah. Awesome. I love it. Right? Eight, we've got 18 <laughs> different part-time professions. Uh, yeah, that's great. Isn't it so great though? Yeah. Um, yeah, awesome. Cool. I'm still trying to get over the 11 cats. I don't know if that's my dream or my nightmare. <laughs> uh, yeah. They're all rescues. My, my one right here is one that I found on the side of the road. Um, her name is Artie and she almost had her leg amputated, but we were able to save it, but she did have part of her tail fall off. So we are mm. hoping to get the rest of it removed soon. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. That is wonderful. I feel like if, if, if I was left unchecked, I would definitely have at least 11 cats. Yeah. Um, mm. We are bleeding hearts. I think that's another thing we talk about. Too. 100%. Yeah. And I've got two dogs also. And if, <laughs> if I could have more, my dream one day is to own a possum and a raccoon. Oh, mm-hmm. oh okay. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, it was so lovely to chat with you. I'm so glad we got to do this. And I know um, I enjoyed it so much. Yeah, yeah. it was love. I loved hearing um I loved hearing your story and your perspective. It was quite, I know, quite emotional. And like I yeah. said, I I really want to go back and give those little girls a hug. <laughs> <sighs> Me too. And thank you so much for what you're doing here. Um, there is one more plug, and I'm sorry. I might be too late, no, but okay. uh, my best friend and I, uh, yeah, my best friend and I, we're starting a podcast here in the next couple of months called Listen to the Shit. Um, <laughs> we're going to be talking about our past marriages and all the shit that happened to them. Um, just a little bit of a preview. I was married to a pastor for about five years, um, uh, and she was married to a psychopath, or like <laughs> verifiable psychopath. So oh, um, we are excited to start that. And then at the end of the readings, I'm going to do tarot card readings, <laughs> or at the end of our each thing we're going to do tarot card readings. So oh, cool! Be on the lookout for that. I think yeah. that's going to be a fun little addition. So, but yeah, that's, um, that's it. I think that's all of it. Yeah, let me know when it launches, and I can put a link to it in the show notes and everything else. Yeah. I'll check in. With, I'll check in with you before the episode launches, just to see. So sometimes cool. we have updates and new projects and stuff that we I can add into the um, intro and, and the show notes. Awesome. So I love that, that sounds exciting. Well, thank you awesome. so much. Yeah, thank you for all you do. Oh, thank you, thank Erica. You. It was so lovely to meet you, and hopefully we can. Love my team. Um, yeah i'm excited to to find out more and watch your unseen adhd and find out you know watch more of your projects i'll happy to support anything you're doing thank you thank you so much well i hope you have a great week katie and you too be yourself keeping yourself because you are amazing (laughs) you too i love that all right take care erica okay bye